Hi, everyone. Oh, Sorry about that. Dr. Annette Mercatant here to answer your questions and give you an update on COVID, our favorite subject. <laughs> so let's get right to the data. We have um, our update, um, our our cumulative totals at the top. We were just talking about this a little bit more. Uh, we're going on two years next month, and this is the cumulative totals since March of 2020. And uh, so we'll be breaking this data out very soon, although total cumulatives will continue to be available on our website and our da dashboard. But to date, we've had over 38,000 cases, over 1,000 hospitalizations, and uh, close to 749 deaths. So with that, in the last seven days, we're seeing about 1,600 new cases in the past week with an average of 234 new cases per day. That's down a little bit. I believe it was 300 last week. So good. Nine COVID-related deaths. That's down. And our positive a test positivity rate is down as well at 34%. Still very high, but definitely on the downward trend. So let's look at the next slide. And this is our epi curve. Very gratifying to see that we are definitely seeing a downward slope and a pretty precipitous downward slope. So uh, this is still going to take a few weeks for us to get to a more reasonable level. So please remember uh, transmission rates still are very, very high at this point. 34%, 36% means you have a very good chance of being exposed even if you don't know it. Uh, most of those people who are getting exposed are, are not exactly being contacted uh, to be told that. So just remember that your your risk is high and you should be using whatever precautions um, you can. Next slide is our vaccination data. So we are still um, not doing the best we can with vaccination rates. We're really not moving this. In fact, we're going to start reporting this vaccination update monthly, I think, because from week to week, it's really not going very far. I'll show you the next slide. We'll talk about that. But really, what I want to point out right now is that for our um, uh, school age children, we are still well below uh, the state average. Um, under 15% for our 5 to 12 year olds and under 30% for our 15 year olds and under. Um, so we just uh, to, you know, to really kind of solidify and, and, and strengthen that that in school in person learning thing, we really need to focus on uh, that age groups vaccination rates. Next slide. The other concerning area here, as you can see, there is a, a dramatic decrease in uh, people seeking vaccinations. In the past uh, week, uh, you might consider what else happened last week, which was that the, the, the Supreme Court struck down the vaccine mandate for businesses and businesses over employees over 100. So with that, I think a lot of people who are kind of moving their um, selves towards a vaccine kind of maybe gave up on that. Um, that's unfortunate. It shows that people will often choose or get vaccinated um, when compelled to, but not always to choose to do it for their own health, which is an unfortunate public health policy that we're very familiar with. Um, so hopefully this will pick up uh, just from the overall overwhelming preponderance of evidence that the vaccine is safe and effective. We're going to say that over and over again because it really is the key to our uh, future um, success. Next slide, please. And this is just one slide that's pulled out of the state data um, uh, modeling data that comes out every two weeks, but this is a great illustration of the difference between people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. Uh, the first one is, I can't read that either. So the first one is cases, uh, overall cases. The dark black line at the top are the total number of cases and in unvaccinated individuals. And then the blue lines at the bottom are vaccinated. You can see a, a, a faintly, uh, a dotted blue line above it, um, that's slightly higher, and that's fully vaccinated without booster doses. So what this slide is starting to illustrate is that booster doses provide increased protection against cases. And then if you go to the right of the slide, you'll look at deaths. This data, by the way, is true for hospitalizations as well. But I think the death that death data is very compelling, and we can see that uh, there is out of all the people who die, the vast, vast majority of them are unvaccinated. Um, and a booster dose, again, protects 
at a greater level than unvaccinated, or excuse me, fully uh, vaccinated without a booster. And I think, did we talk about numbers a little bit? Let's talk about that now. So uh, Brandon had shared with me that since October of last year, we've had 207 deaths. Um, out of those, 35 people were vaccinated and only three people uh, that died were boosted, fully vaccinated and boosted. So again, even locally, a real dramatic difference between those who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. It's worth it, people. It's worth it. Next slide. As usual, our data dashboard is available, um, not only cumulative totals, but you can find a lot of other um, more granular data here. And I'll, I'll put a plug in again for our uh, FAQs, our frequently asked questions. Uh, many of the same questions that come up, came, come up, up and as do mass work, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. We can, um, you can go to that and not only are the answers solid, but we do update them as more data comes out. Okay, so let's move on to talking points. I'm getting close yep. to this. As soon as you I are. get this down, we'll be, we'll be done, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> talking points. So um, obviously the big news this week was the mask order um, that we issued in December for the school year starting January 3rd until tomorrow. And uh, given many of the parameters that I just reviewed, the reduction in overall cases, um, many of the critical resources we were concerned about starting to come back online, including our rapid antigen tests, um, the vaccine being um, readily available now to five and older. Uh, our healthcare systems are all reporting, um, they're managing um, COVID hospitalizations. It's difficult, but they're managing them well. And, and most importantly, communication with our local schools did uh, indicate decreased burdens of COVID, especially in the last week. And um, very few of them have had um, the necessity of, of pausing, which was the goal of our order to begin with, is to keep kids in school. So I'll say again, the order was issued as a preemptive, preventative measure to blunt the impact of Omicron. Uh, knowing it was coming and the impact it was having, we felt that it was prudent to put something in place that would um, improve the likelihood our kids could come back to school and stay in school. And we knew that um, even a month long of, of universal masking would have dramatic impact. Some of the studies now indicate that masking, if done properly, can reduce viral transmission burden by over 50%. So it was well, was well worth it. And so although the order is expiring after tomorrow, after the school day is over tomorrow, we feel that the order was successful and we want people to continue to mask whenever they are in an environment where transmission uh, is high, which is indoor congregate settings, as well as indoor public spaces. Okay. Hey Doc. Yes. Um, before you move on to the next talking point, I just wanted to let you know that we've already had two questions about the monoclonal antibody therapy changes. One from okay. Jamie, who's watching, and one from Diane. So these good. will well, be good talking talk points. Yep. All right. Good question. You guys are on it. That's good because this is a really important thing. As we move into our second year, actually our third year, the real issue is how do we manage this when we have flares? Um, majority of people are are have mild symptoms but not everybody is so lucky and there's enough people who get seriously ill or at high risk for being seriously ill that treatment and making sure they get treatment in a timely way is going to remain very very important so um, as you know we've had monoclonal antibody therapy available for some time um, we knew early on that two of the three formulations were not um, effective against Omicron. And sure enough, they're not. Uh, we do have one left, that is Sotrovimab. However, it is not in an ample supply. We, we're still struggling to get enough in. And as of this week, the FDA has withdrawn its emergency use authorization for the other two. Um, it's been advised now for a couple weeks not to um, utilize it. Because let's face it, if, it, if a drug doesn't work, and there's always potential risks for um, any therapeutic to have um, negative impacts versus positive. You always have to weigh that. And sure enough, if you have a drug that doesn't work, that needs to be given IV, 
uh, which can create soft tissue infections. Um, there is the risk of, of adverse drug reactions. And a monoclonal antibody therapy does not or precludes the ability to get vaccinated for 90 days. All of those reasons made it pretty clear that we really shouldn't be continuing to use uh, the other two formulations, which has really put us in a bind this week. Until we start seeing an expansion of resources, we are following um, an eligibility tiered delivery system that is restricting its use only to the most vulnerable. So let me go over what that tiered um, use is. Um, it's anybody with a moderate to severe immunocompromised condition, regardless of their vaccination state um, and regardless of their age, that would be 12 and older. There is um, some criteria for what that means, and we can um, talk to individuals about that as well. There is anyone over the age of 75 who's not up to date on their vaccines. And anyone over the age of 65 who's also not up to date on their vaccines, but also has a significant COVID risk factor. Um, another category is anyone who's pregnant and not up to date on their vaccinations. Um, that's because we know pregnancy, uh, people with, who are pregnant have a higher risk of, of bad outcomes with COVID infections. And we know that the COVID vaccine is safe in pregnancy. So those are the, the stricter criteria. I do want to say that if we get through this week and we find that we have enough sotrovimab to expand, we'll go to a tier two, which is um, over the age of 65. That's not up to date on vaccinations, but doesn't have any other, other com comorbid conditions. So if you are under the age of 65, and not severely immune or moderately immunocompromised, uh, right now, the monoclonal antibodies are not available to you, unfortunately. This is not good. This is one of the things we really want to keep cases down. The good news is cases are coming down. The demand will come down, uh, and hopefully we'll get these two crossing synergistically, and we can uh, not turn a lot of people away. Um, we also anticipate um, the expansion of this availability now, this would probably be a good time to talk about the fact there are new therapeutics that are coming online. They're not readily available either, but we have some pills, some oral antiviral pills that are now available, although they're not in our county, we can access them. Um, your doctors are getting information about how to prescribe these, and your doctor would need to prescribe these. Um, and they need to be given within five days of onset of infection, not the 10 days for monoclonal. So it's so even a little harder to use these appropriately, but I want people to know that those are available. Um, so uh, we're still working hard to make sure that those of you at higher risk um, have access to these treatments. I don't know. Do you want to answer their questions now while we're at yeah, this level? Um, I think you have, but the first one, Jamie had asked was, why did the monoclonal antibodies protocol change? I can't understand why the unvaccinated would receive priority. The vaccinated have done their job. We deserve priority. That was the one question. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just go over that. Okay. Um, I just went over that slide and it shows that if you're fully vaccinated, your risk of being hospitalized or dying is very, very low. And so the priority is based on the risk of an individual. Now, um, this isn't about who deserves to be treated and who doesn't deserve. We're all human beings, and we don't hold it against people if they make choices uh, that put them at increased risk. We don't refuse to treat people um, for heart disease because they smoke, right? We don't refuse to treat people because they have lifestyle uh, change or, be, or choices that have increased their risk. So similar to that, we just have to treat the people who are at highest risk. And really it benefits all of us because uh, a full hospital is a dangerous hospital for all of us, regardless of um, the condition that we're seeking care for. So um, it's really about their risk and the fact that they are a much greater risk of getting seriously ill and therefore would benefit most from a limited resource. The other question that was about this was from Diane, and she said, I'm confused on the info regarding who is eligible for the antibody treatment. It appears only elders and non-vaccinated are eligible for this treatment if they get COVID. Yeah, just what I went through. Can you still hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I was playing with my microphone. I thought I messed it up. All right, so don't play with the microphone. 
open it. Um, there's actually the state released four tiers, okay? So as soon as resources become more available, we'll be expanding that eligibility. But you're right, uh, it's based on age because we know uh, that's a risk factor and it's based on vaccination status because we know that's a risk factor. And we know that certain medical conditions are a risk factor. So we really have focused on uh, the people we, ha we know have the greatest risk of being hospitalized and dying. Remember that these treatments, the, the value of these treatments is to prevent hospitalizations. Um, they have not been tested to see if you get better quicker or you have a, a, a lesser severe symptom of some kind. Um, the, the, the effect of the treatment has only been studied to reduce the rate of hospital admissions. And so we choose people who are at the greatest risk of hospital admissions. And that's how we've made those choices. I'll do one more question, Doc, about um, somebody asked about the medication. This is from Heidi. She says, hello, Dr. Annette. My question this week is what medication are being used as of now for COVID and how well are they working? Do you find better success in treatment with vaccinated or non-vaccinated, or do you find both do very well on a treatment? So that, so we'll go back to the fact that the, the, the value of treatment to date is to prevent hospitalizations. And because way more people who are unvaccinated end up hospitalized, uh, they, uh, they appear to benefit more from it. Although the studies for that have not been you know, fully vetted out, but that's how the priority schedule is, has been made. Um, we have three medica four medications available, one monoclonal map that can begin within, be given within 10 days and it needs to be given IV. We have two oral medications, antiviral oral medications called Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. Uh, they have to be given within five days of onset of treatment to be effective. And we have one more antiviral called Remdesivir, which has been used in the hospital now for some time, but has now been approved to use pre-hospitalization, but that does require an IV infusion for three uh, consecutive days. So it's a little bit more problematic as far as uh, getting into people. So those are currently the only four treatments we have after you've been infected and um, are showing mild to moderate symptoms and don't yet require hospitalization. Now, if you end up in the hospital, there's a whole different set of criteria. And there is one monoclonal um, Evushield that's, um, we're starting to, I, I believe it's been approved for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and very, very high-risk people. Um, but that is, um, we're not really talking, I don't know if we even have it available right now, to be honest with you. But there is something coming down the pipeline for individuals who are very high risk and they need, they would receive this like every six months for a pre-exposure prophylaxis, I believe is how it would be given. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, my, my apologies. All right, Doc, let's do one question that we got um, last night uh, that came in early. Uh, what are your thoughts about the risk factors of attending a Super Bowl gathering on February 13th of eight individuals, all from different households? I'm showing my ignorance. Where's, where's the Super Bowl this year? What state? Los Where Angeles. Oh, it's in LA. Okay. So um, I, I don't know what the rate is, but of course, everybody from the whole country, the world, converges on the Super Bowl. So it probably doesn't matter if it's a high risk transmission location community wise, but you're pulling a whole lot of people together, which means you're guaranteed to get probably some level of exposure at a Super Bowl game. So what can you do to re reduce your risk if you're going to go? One well, this person's sure talking about at their house. Okay. They're asking if they have all right, I'm sorry. I thought it was all different households. The game. <laughs> They're watching it might be outside, but you're watching in your house. That's a party. So you're talking about just getting together with a bunch of people, yeah, from indoors different households mm -hmm. during um, a high transmission time. Because I don't think by February 13th our rates are going to be super low yet. We're not going to be lo below 10 percent yet. So make sure if you can, everyone's as fully vaccinated as possible. Vaccinations continue to be your best bet for not getting seriously ill. Okay. Number two, um, try and keep your gatherings as small as you can. The less people there, the less risk that someone's going to show up that's got an infection. Just like for the holiday gatherings, you might want to request that people get a test before they come over. 
Very easy, very simple, a little quick nasal swab. It's not a guarantee, but if somebody's positive, uh, you've just saved the day by not having them show up at your party. Um, and last but not least, it would be valuable to wear a well-fitted mask in those situations. Now, of course, you're going to have to remove it to eat or drink. I know that this whole like socially awkward thing, but maybe we can get over that because it does reduce the risk for everyone if people are wearing a, a well-fitted mask as much as possible indoors. And of course, you want to open those windows and have as much ventilation inside as you can as well. Okay. It's 3.50. We're going to try to aim to get these questions and answered within the next 10 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. All right. Um, this is from Dorothy. There has been a lot of breakouts from shingles. Anything to do with COVID? No, I wouldn't think so. Although uh, shingles is a reactivation of the chickenpox virus, right? And no one's exactly sure why people have a reactivation of this virus that lays dormant in your nerve cells after you've recovered from chickenpox. And some people get shingles and some people, and there's a, a, every year, the older you get, the greater your risk of shingles. But there is some theories and some um, uh, value to the idea that sometimes after stress, including an infection, you can... Um, allow the shingles to uh, be reactivated. And so there, I have not heard of an increased rate of shingles through this COVID epidemic. That's really interesting, but it's possible that because we're all struggling with this infection um, and m many of us, if not all of us, will at some point have suffered from this infection, which is um, pretty tough, right? It's a pretty tough viral infection. It might make sense that it may uh, create some um, situations where that virus might, re the shingles virus, the chickenpox virus may reactivate. But that's a theory. And I, I don't want you guys to take that home with you, just a theory. But we do know that sometimes other infections can cause that virus to reactivate as well as stress and fatigue and age. All right, the next question is oh, a great <laughs> shingles vaccine, by the way. It's a really good vaccine. It can markedly reduce your risk of shingles. So go get it. Okay, the next question, we already answered Jamie's and Diane's. Um, Timothy asks, do you see a second booster coming out soon? You know, there's a lot of talk about that. I think in some some European countries are using, using a, a, a second booster. I have seen only some preliminary data that it can reduce some of the hospitalization rates, but I, I can't speak to that. I, I don't see it happening in the immediate future, at least not during this surge. All right. The next question is from Wendy. She asks, are there any plans to booster the homebound? Sure. The homebound should definitely be boosted. Um, and if you need your loved one to be boosted, um, the, the, the um, aggressive vaccine process that we had with home visiting kind of we didn't need it anymore. But if you need somebody that in your household that's homebound and you can't get them out to get a booster, um, give us a call. We can collect those names and see what we can do for you. Or they can always email us too at COVID-19 right. at sinclaircounty.org. All right. This one is from Matthew. He asked, how do you know if the COVID-19 made them die? It could be something else. Am I correct? So we can get this right. Sure. Some people die with COVID and some people die from COVID. And we have to rely on our medical professionals to differentiate that when they sign the death certificate. Um, most of the time, I think they get it right. Sometimes they may not. There is a, a, pr a process that's also reviewed at the vital statistics where they review that and the medical records to see if they're consistent. Um, before a COVID death is, is formally provided to us, usually that vetting process has been done not only by the healthcare provider themselves who signed the death certificate, but also from the vital statistics because the medical records were reviewed at that point. So we, we, I'll go on record to say that we probably underestimate the number of people who die from COVID. For instance, if you die from COVID at home and it's not considered a suspicious death where you might be a medical examiner case, you're not going to get tested for COVID. Um, and they're just going to put, you know, whoever signs your death certificate might put cardiovascular disease or something else that, that 
no, is a known underlying cause, even though your infection may have precipitated or created the situation where that underlying disease became critical, if that makes any sense. So, um, for instance, a lot of people die from pneumonia, uh, but the, the primary problem was COPD, but then they get an infection um, and then that sets them off where they can't survive, uh, where a healthy person with pneumonia will generally maybe do better. I don't know. I, I think I explained that right. I'm not sure. But the idea right. is that when a death certificate is signed, it's signed by a medical professional who's familiar with the individual and can indicate whether or not that death was related to COVID or not. If they just tested it arbitrarily and they died of a stroke, well, stroke might be a, a bad because COVID can cause thrombotic events. Uh, but say they died of a a, a a car accident or trauma and they just got a COVID test in the ER and it was positive, COVID would not go on that death certificate. Hopefully. All right. The next question is from Wendy. Wendy asks, um, is the saliva test more accurate than a nasal test? It's hard to say. Um, right now, they're still recommending nasal swabs because that's how uh, many of our uh, antigen tests, our rapid antigen tests, are uh, approved to be used. Um, there is considerable discussion about whether Omicron attacks a different part of the mucous membranes a little differently and might be more effective to do uh, a, a pharyngeal swab, for instance, the back of the throat or going back to the NP swab, God forbid. Uh, but we, I guess right now the thought is it's still accurate enough to continue using uh, the testing the way it was approved to be tested from the FDA. All right, Laura says, thank you for all you do and the updates. Nora says, thank you for your dedication and efforts to keep us safe. Uh, Lindsay asks, have you started to see any positive flu? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing flu. It's not it's not bumping up the way it is in other states. How many cases have we had? 200 this month. Um, and I believe southeastern Michigan is still the main area that we're seeing influenza, if I looked at that right. So they'll often report influenza in regions. And, and it's, I'm seeing most of the activity here in southeastern Michigan. Um, but we're, we're making a real slow start. I, I really don't doubt we're going to get high. Uh, because it is in other states, but if we're lucky, we'll get high after this peak comes down, which would be really nice. All right. Jennifer said, thank you for everything you and your team have done to keep us safe through this pandemic. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for that. Um, we already answered Heidi's question. Kathy said, thank you for keeping us informed. Uh, Ka Katie asked, if the numbers are still high, why is the mask mandated expired? Why can you not make it to the end of February till the numbers are lower and we're not at high risk? Community compromise. But we also know that masking in schools, and we know this probably, I wouldn't say no, but we're, we suspect given how masking has impacted uh, school settings throughout the country in previous outbreaks, that the biggest impact is at the beginning when, a, when the kids first come in. So. Uh, let's take last fall, for instance, when kids came uh, back from summer break and there was this huge uh, rush of positive cases in school-aged children. And as the cases grew, and this was with Delta, as the cases grew, that percentage of kids actually kind of stabilized and came down because it extends beyond the school and goes into the fuller community. And then masking just in a school doesn't seem to have the impact or the, because now all the kids are getting infected from other places outside the school. So we did suspect that the biggest bang for our buck was gonna be right at the beginning when kids first came in. Uh, the way to impact COVID transmission now would be for everyone to mask, okay? And you know how much trouble we had just from the K through 12. But I will say that if people are serious about reducing transmission and their circle of, of, of things is to keep that mask on uh, for certainly for a few more weeks. All right, it's four o'clock doc, but we have several questions left. So we will continue on. Um, the next question is from Laura. 
could that risk of being hospitalized when you're vaccinated be influenced by having the monoclonal antibodies? Many vaccinated friends had monoclonal antibodies, which made them feel better not long after having them. The risk of being hospitalized when you're vaccinated. Um, no, the risk of being hospitalized. So, so granted, we do we are trying to use as much monoclonal antibodies as we can. But I believe that risk of hospitalizations is independent from receiving monoclonals. Um, I'm looking at Brandon. That might be something we're going to have to double check on. But I don't think the number of people who received monoclonals is significant enough to compensate for that huge. You saw that huge difference in vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Now, remember, too, a lot of people feel better after a week of COVID. So there's a lot of treatment that needs to happen before you can really see a statistically significant difference. Um, in our community, almost everybody feels better after monoclonals because of the just the lower number that we're providing, um, we're providing a couple hundred at a time versus in these studies, you're looking at much more of a number. So um, it's a good question, Laura. I don't believe that's what we're going to find out, but I can tell you that from the, the, the clinical studies with monoclonals, it reduces hospitalization rates by about 80%. I believe that's what we're, and um, the Paxlovid is similar, but not so much for the other ones. So these are independently studied outside of the vaccination status. Oh, there's no question about it. So, so Brandon's adding the fact, I should mention that the, the vaccination status has a much bigger impact on hospitalizations or not than the monoclonal does. So your, your best bet for avoiding a hospital is to be vaccinated. And then after that would come the monoclonals or the other uh, Paxlovid. And of course, um, you know, we already talked about that. So, All right. The next question is from Karen. Are there any studies that vaccines are safe for children with childhood epilepsy? Yeah, well, those studies are coming out. I know that uh, there is more discussion about um, the vaccines being approved for our infants up to four years old in the next couple of months. So we should be seeing that information generally in these clinical studies. They do include common childhood illnesses, chronic illnesses like epilepsy. So um, more to come on that, but I certainly hope that when we, um, when those uh, vaccines for children, infancy are, are reviewed, that we will have that information. So I can't answer that question right now because I haven't seen it, but I, I expect we'll have it. All right, Tracy asks, please review the length of time boosters are effective and any info on if more boosters are needed. Okay, I don't know if more boosters are needed. That's still being discussed and considered. There's a lot of back and forth about that. How long is a vaccine um, effective? And that varies. Um, so there's that's a complicated question because we thought that probably the vaccines would be effective for up to a year, typically at least, okay? But then we had the variants, we had the mutations, and we had, an, uh, we had a variant that escaped immunity, um, not only from vaccines, but also from previous natural immunity. So it really kind of depends on what happens with the virus, as well as um, the long-term studies with mRNA vaccines. We really don't know because the first time we've used these, most vaccines can be effective upward of a year to 18 months. Um, and remember, the main reason they we end up using vaccines more often than that is because of mutations. The reason we have an annual flu vaccine is because the virus changes, not because the vaccine is not good anymore. And I think that's what we're going to have the same issue with COVID. It's not that the vaccine doesn't work anymore, but the virus is going to change. All right. Next question is from Laura. I had the third dose of Moderna in August. Am I supposed to get a booster? So if your third dose of Moderna was because you were immunocompromised, then you should be getting a booster September. January, yeah, you would be eligible for a booster. And by the way, last week I mentioned that boosters were six months after primary and they're really five months after primary. So my bad, they changed that. However, we that too. thank you. If, if you're referring to the fact that you had a third dose in August and that was your booster dose, in other words, that dose, that third dose was actually the dose six months after your primary series that you had had six months prior, then at this point you do not need another vaccine. So we, we, with the definition that we call a third dose 
um, a third dose that we give as a primary series to people who have immunocompromised conditions that don't respond as well to the primary series of vaccine. And we call a booster dose a booster dose. Um, because remember, if we end up with more booster doses, there's going to be, we, we don't want to use the word third or fourth or fifth. We're just going to call it booster dose. All right. I don't know if I answered. I asked you this yet, but from Lucille, she said, when will the FDA release the safety and effects data used to approve this vaccine? Oh, it's all available. They're all, it's all available. Um, it's available from us. You can find the, the, you can find the links with us. You can find the links on the CDC. You can find the links on the FDA. Um, the safety efficacy, they wouldn't have been approved in the first place unless that data was reviewed um, by multiple agencies. So it's all there for you. Uh, Sue asked, what's the point of the home tests if no one accepts them as a valid test? Well, that's that you're right. So what would be what be what if you're gonna take a home test, do something about it, right? Take a home test. Um, if it's positive, a good chance it's gonna be it's really positive, okay? If it's negative and you really think you have COVID, you think you've been exposed, your best bet, especially if you're symptomatic, is to redo the test in a couple of days or seek out a confirmatory test. We do know that antigen, rapid antigen tests can take a little longer to become positive. It just kind of works in a different way. You need more viral load in your body to detect it. So early on in the course of your infection, it may be negative. And if you wait and do it a couple days later, it'll show up positive. So that's a well-known, excuse me, phenomenon. So if you're doing a home test, and it's positive, you need to act accordingly. You need to isolate, you need to tell you the people you've been nearby, that, you, that you've that you exposed them and what they should do. And we're really starting to say, look, people, um, this is this is your ball game. You, you all need to take responsibility for this because there's no way we can keep up with the millions and millions of cases that are occurring. Now, if you do a negative to at home, a test and it's negative and you don't believe it, then repeat it and act accordingly. But if you don't believe any of it and you think it's all hogwash, then why are you doing it anyways? I, I, I can't answer that question. You're absolutely right. But I can tell you it's valuable. It's worthwhile. They're not 100% accurate, but it's sure better than just guessing whether your stuffy nose is from rhinovirus or whether it's from COVID, right? Um, Brian wonders why the does the formula of the flu shot change, but the COVID-19 shot, is, is it still the same if that is actually right. true? Right now, it is the same. He's absolutely right. And it very well might be changing. It's one of the beauties of the mRNA technology is we can change those formulations a lot quicker. And I do believe there's going to be a variation on the next vaccine um, iteration, if you will, I've heard. Although I don't know how soon it's coming out. I mean, it can't be instantaneous. I mean, it takes us an entire year to, and we have a whole system in place to revamp influenza vaccine every year, right? There's this complex system involved where we monitor and do the surveillance and and you know decide what's going to go into it months and months ahead of time so it's not like we can on the you know just kind of a snap of our fingers shift and, and put a new vaccine out there but i do I, I have been hearing things along those lines that the, the vaccine will shift to accommodate uh major variations and the vac uh the virus as time goes by all right jenny says we appreciate you and your staff, thank you. Sue asks, why are some doctors telling their patients they won't treat them if they have COVID? I was told I need help with anything to go to the ER. I cannot come into the doctor's office. They called me every day to see how I was, but they wouldn't help me. So two things, I guess, um, to, to defend my colleagues, um, this is new. And a lot of these treatment modalities that I just went over with you are, are brand new and they're really difficult still to access. So as treatments become more available, I think your, your primary care providers are gonna be better and better at responding to this. Of course, the second reason is there've been so many variabilities. Their offices are closed, their offices are open. Are they gonna infect their staff? Are they not gonna infect their staff? Um, people are struggling with staffing. Um, we're having a lot of trouble in the healthcare world with staff, people being able to come in and work. And so if you're, on, you know, you're having a bare bones amount of staffing, um, you don't want to expose them all to COVID by bringing somebody in and then losing all of them. See, so I think 
the process of how they do this, I'm not saying it, it's got to be improved, and I think it will improve. Uh, but probably what they're doing is trying to do their best to provide you support and guidance um, with not a lot of tools. Let's face it, not a lot of ton of tools and monitoring. And if you're sick enough uh, where where they would intervene, you're sick enough probably to go to the ER. And so that vital thing is really important. Um, are you having trouble breathing? Are your fevers not breaking? Um, you know, all of those things that they, they check you for. All right. Nikki asks, is BA2 in Michigan or St. Clair County? Do you know anything about BA2 and if it's a concern? That's the new variant. I barely, yeah, I've just been hearing about it. No, I don't believe it's on anybody's radar. It's brand new. Uh-huh. It's not in Michigan. No. Uh, I want you to understand that the CDC and the NIH, these national uh, organizations, are monitoring variants by the thousands. Seriously, they have a really sophisticated system where they sample COVID virus and they're looking constantly for variants of concern. And it, you know, when they find something, they're going to find it early. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to end up being like Omicron. Okay. So I don't want people to get like overreactive time or time there's a variant. We're going to see variants. There's absolutely no question we're going to see variants. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get another surge as a result of it. So, um, it's important to watch and pay attention to, but I don't want people to panic about it. We're going to hear about lots of variants all the time because they're looking for them, right? And when you're looking for something, you find it. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a clinical significance to it. So we'll, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. How's that sound? Uh, Nikki also asked, can you reinfect with Omicron if you had it and was vaccinated? How long immune? How long immune if you had Omicron and not vaccinated? So yes, you can get reinfected with Omicron and probably more so than with some of the other variants, but I can't give you quantitative like information, like you have this much risk of being reinfected um, versus with a previous infection. But you do have a greater risk of being reinfected with Omicron from both a previous infection as well as from being vaccinated. Um, but you have the greatest risk of getting infected with Omicron, which is, by the way, the only variant, probably the only virus we have right now, probably to any extent. Um, you have the greatest risk from that if you're unvaccinated and not previously infected. So um, do with that what you want. I, you know, at this point, I think you just everybody's got to be careful, and even those who are vaccinated have to be careful. Um, Although if you're vaccinated, and I'll say this over and over again, if you're fully vaccinated, you're much less likely to be hospitalized. If you've just been previously infected and get Omicron, your risk of hospitalization is greater than somebody who's been vaccinated and reinfected, if, if you follow me. So uh, it's just kind of gradations of risk here. Okay, it's 412. We have a couple more minutes. Um, the next question I'll ask is from Jonathan. Survival rates for COVID is around 99 to 96% per the CDC. What's Omicron survival rate? Probably a little bit higher. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. So survival rates are funny. I've seen people say, oh, you know, we've had 800 pediatric deaths with COVID and we've got so many hundreds of thousands of kids and therefore uh, the fatality rate for kids is 0. 0.000. You don't do it that way. You, you you do the, the proportion of the, the deaths per known disease, okay? Um, so um, for the people who have known disease with Omicron, lots of them get infected or die proportionally, how or get, excuse me, hospitalized or die. However, there are so many more people who get Omicron that numbers seems to be kind of washing out. So we're not seeing um, an increase in deaths as you would expect despite a, a, a pretty substantial increase in hospitalizations. Uh, but we're also, so that would suggest right, really the, the death rate is gonna be lower from Omicron, but there's still a really high death rate because there's so many people who are getting infected and getting in the hospital from it. So I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tricky question that people throw at me like this 99.999, but you gotta remember that's two things. One, it's, it's you, you can do your math a lot of ways, but you're not allowed to do your math 
however you want to. Um, that's not the way we do it. And the second thing really is that 1% of the population is a lot of people. It's a lot, lot of people. Even 1% of our population in little old St. Clair County is 1,600 people. It's a lot of people. And I've already said that we've had um, 750 deaths um, in our county alone. So um, I don't think that's chump change, but I guess you can decide what you, you think is a significant amount of deaths and hospitalizations. And we'll, um, we'll probably disagree because I think even one preventable death is worth, is worth preventing. Okay, we're going to end the show now. If anyone has any questions, they can email us at COVID-19 at stclaircounty.org. We will be back next week at 3.30, and then starting in February, which is next week already, we're going to move back to a monthly show once a month. So email those questions to us um, if we missed any today or if you have any more. Any closing comments, Doc? Just take care of yourselves, people. Don't let your guard down, and let's think spring. It's going to be a nice spring, I hope. So keep your keep your chin up and let's hope for the best.